Thanks very much. And the next item of business is Portfolio Questions on Culture, Europe and External Affairs. And in order to get as many questioners in as possible, I would prefer short and succinct questions and answers, please. And uh, Mr Russell, if you're ready, question one, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the National Museum of Scotland regarding the request to repatriate to Canada the remains of the last two members of the Beothook tribe? Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the National Museum of Scotland has confirmed that it has met those wishing the Beothook uh, remains to be repatriated to Canada, and they have explained the established mechanism for making a formal repatriation request and have yet to receive a formal request but expect it to be made. The National Museums of Scotland has advised that it has yet to receive the formal request, but it will consider any such request carefully. Decisions on repatriating individual items in the National Museum's collection are, in the first instance, for the Board of the National Museums of Scotland, acting in that respect independently of the Scottish Government. Mike Russell. Uh, I welcome that response from the Cabinet Secretary, and I'm grateful to her. I'm sure she would agree with me that whilst, of course, this is a matter in the first instance of the Board of the National Museum, the keeping of skulls is surely not a 21st century response to the common humanity we share with these two individuals who were the last recorded individuals of this tribe, a tribe that was wiped out probably because of environmental pressures on our hunting grounds as well as by uh, cultural pressures. Perhaps it would be an appropriate response to that shared humanity to ensure that when the request comes, it is dealt with speedily and in a humane fashion so that we can set this matter to rest. Secretary. Uh, the National Museums of Scotland are well aware of the sensitivity of the issue and indeed there's well developed guidance on repatriation of human remains uh, from Scottish collections in the light of the human tissue legislation passed in Scotland in 2006 and indeed an example of, of re returns were to Wellington uh, from the NMS in 2007. I reiterate that the decision is for the NMS board, but ministers then may have a legal designation um, for the receiving institution in Canada as an appropriate body. But I very much uh, take on board the members' points that this is an issue of humanity and should be treated as such. Many thanks. Question two, Neil Finlay. As the Scottish Government, which ministers have met with representatives of the Government of Qatar since it was awarded the 2022 World Cup? Minister Humza Yusuf. Scottish ministers have met with Qatari officials on a number of occasions since 2010 when Qatar was awarded the 2022 World Cup. Most recently I met with Mr Khalid Rashid Al-Mansouri, Head of European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we discussed a number of issues, including those of the rights of migrant workers. Mr uh, According to press reports, the Minister for External Affairs went on a trip to Qatar from the 19th of May 2013, and the First Minister visited some time between the 27th of October and the 4th of November 2011. Can the Minister advise why there is no detail of uh, these ministerial visits what, and what they did on those visits in the ministerial diaries? And will they now, the Government now release all information about these visits? Because two weeks ago, when asked, the Minister said it was an administrative error why there was no detail in the diaries. It would appear that administrative error still pers persists. Minister. I would say to the, the member, you know, the Scottish Government aims to be as transparent uh, as possible about meetings that are undertaken by ministers. And the reason given at the time of that press report absolutely stands. Uh, there was a clerical error, not just on that visit, on a number of visits. And I accept that point. And now it takes time, of course, for that clerical error to be rectified. So we are hopefully and we will publish that updated list soon. But I would say to the member on this occasion, uh, including the trip that he refers to, the Qatar trip of 2013, it was not some kind of secret. In fact, his own researcher tweeted the link to the announcement that we made at that time. So this is not the work of the Illuminati or the Knights Templars. There is no conspiracy theory. We are happy to continue to give details. And I would say on this issue, which I know is close to the member's heart, that I'm happy to work with him, to talk to him about that, discuss with him this issue, because this government has raised the issue of migrants, workers, not just in Qatar, but across the Gulf region. And if he's serious about that issue, then I, my door is always open to talk to him about how we can work together to, in order to ensure that workers are treated uh, correctly, not just in Qatar, but indeed across the entire region. Thanks. Question three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to promote and support Gaelic culture. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. 
Scottish Government's support for Gaelic culture has been significant. Support for MG Alba has transformed broadcasting in Scotland. Our support for Gaelic education has created a significant and successful sector. Uh, support for Borna Gaelic has enabled Gaelic to be promoted in many areas of Scottish public and community life. Our support for Gaelic arts and cultural events has allowed a minority community to have a significant impact on Scottish cultural life. Uh, Creative Scotland is providing over £5 million to Gaelic organisations and other organisations with a high Gaelic content over the three years from 2015 to 2018. And last week on the 10th of June, I was delighted to present a Creative Places Award to Stornoway and the islands of Lewis and Harris at an event hosted by Creative Scotland with support from Event Scotland. They won £125,000, which will be used for a project called Bialach, uh, marking Stornoway as a gateway to the creative community of the Outer Hebrides. You, Rhoda Grant. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and she will be aware uh, that Gaelic culture and heritage is often passed down through poetry and song. Tags is that we need to be able to speak the language and understand it. And she talks about, in her, in her previous answer, support for education, but she will be aware that there has been a marked drop of the number of pupils choosing Gaelic as a language in school, and that has led to a fall on the number of students actually gaining a qualification. Can I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that edu the education system system is providing the education and skills required to access our culture and heritage. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, these are questions on culture, Europe and external affairs. If she wants to direct her questions to my education uh, colleagues, I'm sure they'll be uh, willing to uh, respond to her directly on her educational matters. Her original question was about culture. I've answered about the cultural celebrations, and I'm delighted that, particularly with our young people, there's been such an, uh, an expanse, uh, particularly in the provision of Gaelic education in the early years. If she wants to direct her questions on education to education ministers, I'll ensure they're answered. Thank you so much. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Notwithstanding the answer the Cabinet Secretary has given to Rhoda Grant, could I ask whether any discussions have taken place between the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and the Cabinet Secretary for Education about how to find more teachers of Gaelic? These, this is the, the question time for culture, Europe and external affairs. More than happy to answer questions on culture. Questions on education should be directed, as she well knows, to my education colleagues. But as far as celebration and indeed promotion of Gaelic culture is concerned, uh, the investment that my department has given to uh, the Fesh Ross uh, in terms of uh, support for MG Alba, in terms of film and television, Gaelic Books Council, for example, £620,000, and indeed um, uh, Fesh and Gale, £1.5 four million pounds. So I, I'm very pleased about the support and, uh, that I can provide in my role as uh, culture minister. And indeed, when I was education minister, I was instrumental in ensuring that Gaelic schools uh, were developed. But precisely in relation to issues around Gaelic education, those questions, I would ask presiding officer, are directed to the education questions, which are, I think are a different session. OK, I think we'll move on to question four. Christian Allard. Scottish Government. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has been invited by the UK Government to discuss its negotiation proposals regarding the EU reform. Mr Humza Youssef. I thank the Member for the question. The Scottish Government has proactively shared its agenda for EU reform with the UK Government, published on August, the four, uh, August 2014, uh, where it outlines a number of measures for improvement uh, and reform within the existing EU treaty framework. I thank the Minister for his answer, but can I give us some reassurance that the Scottish Government will make representation to ensure the needs and priorities of our fishing industry are not forgotten by the UK Government during this EU negotiation? We all remember where, how we were sold down the river during the EU negotiation by West, uh, when a Westminster Government official put it uh, in the wider UK context. They, the Scottish fishermen, must be regarded as expendable. Minister. I think the member makes uh, an important point, and Richard Lockhead has been a real champion uh, of these matters uh, and others, and we continue to urge uh, the UK Government, of course, uh, when there is uh, issues surrounding uh, uh, fishing that are to be spoken about at uh, Agriculture and Environment Council, then actually Richard Lockhead uh, is there to represent uh, Scotland and Scotland's uh, interest in that regard. He'll also note the speech recently made by the First Minister herself in Brussels, where she used the CFP as an example of actually how the EU uh, could be better reformed as well. So, uh, yes, we'll continue uh, to make those representations to the UK Government in terms of the renegotiation, any renegotiation that takes place. Then, of course, Scotland's voice, and indeed that of all the devolved administrations, uh, should be listened to. Clear Baker. 
Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government's support for continued membership of the EU is not conditional upon reform? And also can he say what the Scottish Government are doing in terms of inviting businesses, charities and Civic Scotland to come together to help promote the positive case for continued membership? I think both questions are, are, are really uh, excellent, actually. And in terms of the latter question, in regards to uh, bringing together civic society, bringing together businesses, academics, she's absolutely correct. Uh, the Scottish Government has a role in that, and various discussions and facilitations uh, are taking place. But, of course, all of us have a responsibility in that. I would say to her that I don't believe that the campaign uh, to stay within the European Union has to necessarily be politician-led, and I think that was the, what she was alluding to in her question, so I would certainly agree with that. But in terms of uh, her, her former point, uh, she's, again, correct. Uh, although we wish to see reform of the European Union, and we've set out some of that reform, both in our agenda for reform and then subsequently with the speech by the First Minister, uh, that uh, is regardless of what kind of renegotiation the Prime Minister uh, happens to come back with, uh, from Europe. So we are uh, pro-European. We believe that Scotland is best served remaining a member of the European Union. Uh, and indeed, the European Union is stronger for having Scotland and the rest of the United uh, Kingdom within it, uh, regardless of what the Prime Minister uh, manages to renegotiate on our behalf. Many thanks. Question five, Margaret McCullough. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to the UK Government regarding the Mediterranean refugee crisis. Secretary Fiona uh, as I said in my reply to Alison Johnson on the 21st of April, the Scottish Government has consistently raised the concerns about migrants risking their lives to cross the Mediterranean and reach the EU and will continue to use every opportunity uh, to press for action on what is a humanitarian emergency. Following the UK election, I wrote again to Mr Brokenshire on the 20th of May, as I promised, expressing the views of this Parliament, as stated in our debate of the 6th of May. I have not yet received a response. First Minister, uh, the First Minister also raised this issue when she met with David Cameron, and I understand that uh, Scottish Government officials have had early discussion in relation to UK Government views on refugee settlement with Home Office officials. My colleague Hamza Youssef, Minister for Euro uh, Europe uh, and International Development, again re reiterated the Scottish Government's position on Monday, calling on the UK Government to participate in EU proposals on refugee re relocation and to take a proportionate share of people fle fleeing conflict and persecution. Thank you. Margaret McCullough. Thank you for that lengthy reply. And I think you may have answered all my questions, but I'll carry on anyway in case I've missed anything out. While I accept that funding for the EU's Operation Triton has trebled, there's still huge concerns about reports that almost 2,000 refugees and migrants have died across the Mediterranean this year. What can the Scottish Government do, you've said directly but also indirectly, to make the UK Government and other governments in Europe strengthen their commitment to deal with this ongoing tragedy on, Europe, on Europe's doorstep? Cabinet Secretary. Well, to supplement my initial answer, um, a, a number of issues in terms of uh, influencing other governments. Also, I, I can add that the First Minister in her speech in Brussels in recent weeks included reference in particular to the issue around migrants. I know the Italian government is very appreciative of not only mine, but the, the Chamber's interest and continuing interest in this issue. And in very practical terms, there is the issue of relocation and resettlement and the UK's responsibilities. I think if collectively, uh, and that's why it was so helpful to have that debate we had in the Parliament to send to the UK government, collectively uh, we can indicate that our desire, not just for that immediate humanitarian issue to be addressed, and that's I think the point of her, her question, but also the longer term issues. Uh, I think it's not the only question about humanity that's been raised uh, in the questions today and I, I thank her for raising it again. Many thanks. Question 6, Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports voluntary sector organisations working in developing countries. Minister Wimsa Yusuf. Thank the member for, for the question. The Scottish Government supports voluntary sector organisations working in developing countries uh, in, in many ways. Our international development fund, which is £9 million per year, as an example, our £6 million climate justice fund, uh, both of those support robust programmes for development that have been delivered by a range of organisations and institutions in Scotland, including those from the voluntary sector, uh, working with their partners overseas. Uh, as part of this, we're also providing just over £450,000 in 2015-16 to 15 organisations that are smaller from our small grants programme, which deliver a broad range of capacity building, feasibility and project grants to smaller organisations. Jim McGregor. Um, will the Minister join me in congratulating Marius Meals, headquartered in Dalmally in my region, and led by my inspirational constituent, Magnus McFarlane Barrow, 
on its recent announcement that it is now providing one million children in some of the world's poorest countries with a meal every day they attend school. Do they agree with me that Mary's Meals is a world-class example of the impact the voluntary sector can have in developing countries and how the Scottish Government and how can the Scottish Government help other national and international voluntary organisation, organisations learn from this best practice? Thank you so much. Minister? Yes, uh, of course I join him uh, in that. Uh, I agree with him in terms of his inspirational constituent, Magnus uh, McFarlane Barrow, who was, I think, mentioned amongst one of the most influential uh, Catholics in the list that was made up recently, and I think he very much deserved his spot in the top ten uh, within that, because his inspiration is not just rooted here in Scotland, but of course across the world. I sent a message, uh, a video message to Mary's Meals uh, to congratulate them specifically on this great achievement of now feeding a million children every day uh, across the world. It is phenomenal, and I want Scotland to be known and judged by how compassionate it is uh, as a country across the world, and nobody de better demonstrates that uh, than Mary's Meals. In regards to what further we can do, of course, we have our International Development Fund and other such things. Uh, perhaps me and uh, the member and I can have a discussion on perhaps post Smith on how we can have uh, our development, international development on a statutory footing uh, as other organisations like NIDOS and the Scottish Malawi Partnership have asked for uh, and perhaps uh, if we do that then we'll be able to have more powers, perhaps even more resource uh, towards international development uh, in the future but I agree with them entirely on the achievements of Mary's Mules. Many thanks. Question 7, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the proposal that 16- and 17-year-olds and European nationals living in the UK will not be able to vote in the EU referendum. Minister. The Scottish Government does not support the UK Government's proposals to exclude 16- and 17-year-olds and EU citizens living in the UK from voting on the referendum on membership of the European Union. We would urge, strongly urge, the UK Government to draw on the democratic success of the independence referendum and amend the bill accordingly to allow all 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote and indeed EU citizens uh, living in the UK to vote in the referendum. Yeah, Bill Kidd. I thank the uh, Minister for his reply and also for the enthusiasm, my colleague Christian Allard. Um, <clears throat> may I, may I uh, also uh, ask if it's possible for the Minister or his officials uh, to provide me with the numbers of both 16 and 17 year olds and European uh, Union residents who are affected living in my constituency of Glasgow Annie's Land as a typical Scottish parliamentary constituency. Minister? Uh, I will certainly ask officials and uh, <laughs> test their uh, statistical dexterity in this regard. Uh, so I don't know if the statistics will be available uh, extrapolated down to his specific constituency, but I can tell him. Uh, as we know, there are uh, over 170,000 uh, EU citizens, and of course, we have a very prominent one in this chamber. But nonetheless, uh, all of us in our individual constituencies know many members of, uh, across the European Union who have chosen to make our constituencies and regions their home, and they should not be excluded. And that also goes for 16 and 17 year olds. In our constituencies, many of us have visited high schools throughout the, the, the period of the referendum, and all of us will have been enthused uh, by, in fact, their enthusiasm uh, and indeed uh, their interest and engagement within the democratic process, and that should not be stifled uh, because of the whim of the UK Government. Thank you. Finally, Graham Pearson, question uh, Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in establishing cultural links between Scotland and China. In the, uh, the previous First Minister signed a cultural memorandum of understanding with China in December 2011 to strengthen Scotland's cultural links with China. As part of the MOU, the Scottish Government has provided networking opportunities to enable creative practitioners to develop cultural links and partnerships with the Chinese creative sector. Earlier this year, Scottish Ballet toured Romeo and Juliet. The Tron Theatre toured its co-production of Ulysses and NVA took Speed of Light to Beijing. And the Scottish Government is contributing to UK-China Year of Cultural Exchange 2015. Jim Pearson. Thank you for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary and the Minister knows that the cross-party group place a great deal of importance uh, to cultural links and believe the development of language, Chinese language in our schools, an improvement of the visa situation and direct flights between Scotland and China would be very important in that circumstance. Uh, can she report any developments in the past year in any of these issues? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, in, in terms of a, a number of these areas, we are taking forward, for example, um, the cross-party group working on the visa issue. This visa issue is not just for business, but also, as he identifies, can actually prevent artists in terms of their travel and particularly in relation timing-wise to productions. In terms of work with schools, that continues and is developing. Uh, but also, in terms of all of this, the cultural connections that we can make um, really helps um, establish those issues. Obviously, an issue is in relation to direct flights. That's a continuing issue that he'll know that our, our government is continually pressing and trying to develop. But obviously, that takes time. Many thanks. And that concludes that series of portfolio questions. We now move to infrastructure investment and cities. Question one, Margaret McDougall. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Microphone. Ask... Microphone. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding securing the future of Glasgow Prestwick Airport. And it's Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, Glasgow Prestwick Airport continues to operate on a commercial basis at arm's length from Government, and Scottish Government officials last met their Westminster counterparts on the 29th of May to discuss the process for determining the location of the UK spaceport. Margaret McDougall. Well, I'm delighted to hear that, and I look forward to hearing the outcome uh, of that decision on the spaceport. But my question is on, uh, as part of the Scotland Bill package, air passenger duty is due to be devolved to the Scottish Government. With control of this tax, the Scottish Government could generate a boost to all Scottish airports. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline today what work is being done in identifying a replacement to APD, and do these considerations include the assessment of both the cost and environmental implications? Cabinet Secretary. I should say that uh, it is not the Government's position to seek to replace APD. Uh, in fact, we would like to have uh, been able to take action some six years ago when the Calming Commission proposed that it should be devolved to Scotland, but that has not been possible and will not be possible until it is actually devolved in future. Our intention, as stated on a number of occasions, is first of all to reduce the impact by around half. And yes, we have done the calculations uh, on that um, in terms of the costs. And also, in future, as public resources allow, that would take place in the course of the next Parliament. Uh, and in future, uh, to try and reduce it uh, to zero. Um, but, of course, that would only happen as public resources allow. There has been some work done on the environmental impact, and I'm happy to get that information and pass it to the member. But the substantial point that she makes about the benefit to all of Scotland's airport, I think, is a very good one. It would be substantially beneficial. Ryanair, who are the main uh, passenger users uh, at Presswick, for example, have said they would expect it to have around a million more passenger journeys. Now, uh, the Orc Aviation Report, which goes into this in some detail, into which all airports in Scotland, I think, and many of the airlines contributed, say there would be a substantial economic benefit. That would be for the airports, it would be for the aircraft uh, uh, companies themselves, but it would also be for the general population in Scotland because of the economic benefit from more people coming to this country. So this is something we want to do. A fair bit of work has been done already. Work is ongoing. There will be a consultation exercise, and I will provide the member with environmental information that she has asked for. Thank you. Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the closure of Presswick Airport would have been devastating for Ayrshire and the local economy? And does he maintain that the action taken by the Scottish Government to purchase the airport was the right thing to do and remains so? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely. It's a very uh, important point, uh, which can sometimes be lost with the passage of time. Uh, I'm in no doubt that we were right to purchase Glasgow Presswick. Uh, closure was on the cards. Indeed, the previous owners of Presswick Airport were working on a specific time frame and on a specific day to pull down the shutters at the airport. And we, as the Scottish Government, were not willing to stand by and to let that happen. I think the member will recall that Scottish Enterprise estimated that around 3,200 local jobs are directly or indirectly based in and around Glasgow Presswick. And we can all imagine the impact of that level of job losses on the area. With the right team in place and the right business plan for the future and the support of key local partners like South Ayrshire Council, we believe the airport can have a positive future and the government can also achieve a return on its own investment. Many thanks. Question to Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has had discussions with the UK Government regarding a city deal for Edinburgh and surrounding areas. Cabinet Secretary. As I've 
As I have made clear on a number of occasions, uh, I and the Scottish Government have, uh, remain very willing to work with any Scottish city to unlock investment, whether that is done individually or collectively, and whether that is through a city deal, uh, which is one of the Scottish Government's devolved initiatives to stimulate uh, growth and deliver infrastructure and investment, or a combination of other measures. Uh, to date, discussions on a possible city-region deal for Edinburgh have not included the UK Government, albeit that a recent meeting did take place between officials from Highland Council, the Scottish Government and the UK Government, but we expect those discussions to take place in due course when Edinburgh further develops its proposals. Malcolm Tism. Thank the uh, Minister uh, for that answer and hope that progress will be made soon and that he will discuss it with the UK Government, given that a proposal has been worked up uh, by the Edinburgh uh, City Region. And can he confirm uh, in expectation of progress that the Edinburgh City Region deal will be taken into account as part of the draft Scottish Budget to be published in the autumn? Well, that would very much depend on the progress that has been made. And I think the member will be aware that different cities are at different stages in terms of their uh, development. I think there has been a, an issue that has been raised with me about whether the UK Government would honour the commitments which it made in its own March budget statement. Uh, and we have to move at the pace of all those involved. Uh, I should say that the meeting which I referred to earlier between Highland Council, the UK Government and the Scottish Government was a positive discussion. So I remain hopeful that the Edinburgh City deal can make progress, but it will be done as part of a process that involves this, this Government, the City Council itself. And yes, they have worked up a proposal, but I think they would concede there is more work to be done in relation to that, and obviously including uh, the UK Government at that time as well. Dave, Dave Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned meetings with uh, Highland Council and, and the, the two governments and so on. I just wonder if you can elaborate a bit more on whether you know, the UK Government, if he knows whether they are going to honour their commitments made before the last general election when they made promises in relation to city deals for both Aberdeen and uh, Inverness. Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned, I think the meeting which took place just last week between uh, the Council, the UK Government and the Scottish Government uh, did have a positive uh, tenor to it, and the expectation is that, yes, the UK Government will follow through on its previous commitments in relation to uh, a city deal for Inverness. Okay, thanks. Question three, Sarah Boyer. To ask the Scottish Executive when it will publish an updated infrastructure investment plan. Sorry, Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary. We are working to publish the refreshed infrastructure investment plan later this year. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and say, um, given the range of different projects, um, health, schools, justice, further and higher education, culture and enterprise buildings, how many of those projects include renewable heat and power infrastructure as part of the programme? And will he give the commitment that the refresh programme will include heat and power schemes um, as part of the key um, priority for the next round of infrastructure projects? Cabinet Secretary. I think on the first part of Sarah Boyat's question, I'm happy to provide the member with that information in detail and we'll send that to her. On the second part, I think that obviously has to be a consideration for the refreshed infrastructure investment plan. The one that we have just now, of course, itself was refreshed at the time of the last um, spending review. And again, we're trying to tie those two things uh, together as we review the infrastructure investment plan. There are a number of uh, projects in the investment plan, not least in relation to, for example, uh, electrification of rail lines, which we want to see if we can maximise our contribution to helping the environment. Uh, but it will be for individuals. Uh, the member mentioned, for example, schools and other projects, uh, which are often in the remit of local authorities. It will be for them to come forward with those proposals. But as I say, I'm happy to let her know what we're doing just now, and it will be something we'll take into account in the next review of the plan. Thank you very much, Jim Eady. Uh, notwithstanding the persistent cuts to Scotland's capital budget by the UK Government, can the Cabinet Secretary set out the scale of the Scottish Government's transport investment programme and, in particular, how this investment will benefit my constituents in the City of Edinburgh? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, well, the member should know, I think, that we are maximising our capital spending and supporting an investment-led recovery, despite our capital Dell budget being reduced by around a quarter in real terms between 2010-11 and 2015-16, using all the levers at our disposal. And the scale of Transport Scotland's direct and indirect capital budget for 2015-16 is just over a billion pounds, which includes £269 million for the replacement fourth crossing, a project which will directly benefit Edinburgh and the member's constituents. Uh, there's also a total 
total investment of £1.4 billion, which at its peak is estimated to support 1,200 jobs, many of which will come from the local area. And augmenting that budget is a revenue-funded infrastructure programme, including the non-profit distributing pipeline and regulatory asset-based RAB investment in rail infrastructure. And that programme includes a number of major projects which will improve connectivity between Edinburgh and the rest of the country, projects such as the Borders Railway, uh, the Edinburgh-Glasgow Rail Improvement Programme, and the M8, M73, M74 motorway improvements, £430 million of which have a total overall capital investment uh, together of £1.5 billion. Thank you very much. A uh, question for in the name of Liz Smith was not lodged. An explanation has been provided. Question 5, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what representations it has received regarding the cost of flights to and from Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles. Mr Derek Mackay. Uh, we are aware of recent concerns expressed about commercial airfares in the Highlands and Islands. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of the air services in question and is committed to continuing the air discount scheme, which provides a 40 per cent subsidy for eligible passengers. The issue of air services to the islands was raised by the islands authorities at the recent Islands Area Ministerial Working Group, where it was agreed that a scoping paper would be produced to look at these vital services in their totality, covering a range of issues, including fares. I have also agreed to meet with a delegation of campaigners, as well as a number of MSPs, including Mr Stewart, to discuss the issue in the way forward. Dave Stewart. Yes. Officer, is the Minister aware of the online campaign Islanders Against Flybe and Loganair Excessive Prices, which has secured over 14,000 followers? The Labour-led Scottish Executive introduced their discount scheme to make air services more affordable for island and remote communities. What specific plans does the Minister have to address the sky-high prices being charged to islanders travelling from Orkney, Shetland and the Western Isles and beyond? Minister? Well, of course, the first thing that should be celebrated is that this Scottish Government has continued the scheme and has committed to its uh, continuation. But actually, fares is not the only issue that I'm aware of in terms of uh, air services to the islands. There's a serious issue uh, around uh, reliability as well, and they are connected. Therefore, I will meet with campaigners, I will meet with local councillors, and of course, uh, MSPs on the subject to fully explore the issues and indeed what options government may have. Because of the commercial uh, nature, we may be limited in terms of what we can do in cost capping and so on, uh, but I would want to apply pressure to the operators around the affordability um, of air services because we do share the concern about the uh, nature of the services uh, and the increases that have been experienced. And there is no real prospect of competition uh, on most of these routes. And I think operators should be very mindful of that and very mindful of the importance that local communities uh, attach to these air services as part of the, the, the transport mix that ensures that islands are not an isolated part um, of Scotland. I'm happy to engage with Mr Stewart and other members uh, to find consensus across the Parliament on a way forward. Liam MacArthur, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As, as claims are put, being put in for the air discount scheme, can I put on record uh, my gratitude to my colleague, uh, Tavis Scott, for introducing it when the, uh, as the Transport Minister. The Minister quite rightly points to the issue of reliability uh, and the, the problems that that's caused, conflated with the, the, the high costs uh, that still exist on these routes. Uh, I'm due to meet with the Minister uh, and Tavis Scott next Tuesday, subject to there being no delays with my flight down next Tuesday morning. <laughs> Uh, will the Minister undertake um, to carry out a bit of scoping work on some of the options that can be done to address this issue uh, of reliability, which, as I say, is a toxic mix with the issue of cost that Dave Stewart referred to? Minister? Uh, yes, I will uh, commit uh, to that work. Uh, the scoping work should look at the reliability of, of current services, uh, including the aircraft. And, of course, we will take a very close look uh, at fares because they are all connected and I'd want to have a very constructive conversation with the operators as to how we take it uh, forward. But what the online petition represents is a very strong uh, feeling from the islands as to how they've been treated in this uh, situation. And I think just as every party uh, in the chamber has claimed credit for the air discount scheme, we can keep that consensus together as we work towards uh, addressing this uh, cost and reliability issue. Uh, going forward. Many thanks. Question 6, Stuart Stevenson. 
to ask the Scottish Government what matters the Islands Transport Forum will discuss at its first meeting. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, earlier this month in Orkney, I announced that a new Islands Transport Forum will be set up to consider strategic transport issues affecting Scotland's islands. The forum will meet biannually and will include representatives from local authorities with island communities. It is intended that the forum would deal with internal and external ferry, air and other transport services upon which each of the island communities so heavily depend for social cohesion and sustainable economic activity and growth. I am in the process of finalising the detailed membership and working methods for the new forum in consultation with the island authorities. Uh, therefore, no detailed agenda items have been yet set for its first meeting. Many thanks. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Minister, and indeed for the content of your previous uh, reply to question five, which touched on this issue as well. I wonder if I might introduce something uh, quite new the Minister is unlikely to be familiar with. Uh, as air navigation and approach uh, procedures change, uh, with uh, moving towards uh, GPS instrument approaches not yet adopted in the UK, but eminently suitable for airports such as the government's airports and local authority airports that might make a contribution to improving reliability in poor weather conditions. Will he ensure that he talks to uh, people involved in the Islands Transport Forum and thereafter consider approaching the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK Government to see if we can pilot some of the new technologies which are much cheaper than the previous ones? Brief answer will do, Minister. I will give that very close consideration, and yes, I will. <laughs> Many thanks. <laughs> Question 7, Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when Ministers last met the management of Scottrail. Minister. The Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities met with Scotrail's Commercial Director yesterday. The member will be aware of recent events in relation to Abellio's Dutch operations alongside their parent company, NS. And I can advise that I have held discussions with Abellio UK and sought assurances that these issues are being properly addressed both inside uh, Abellio and NS. You, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President President Officer. I am grateful to uh, the Minister's comments and to his reference, uh, of course, to recent events at Abellio, where we have seen very senior departures from the company here in Scotland. Uh, and in Holland, and the Dutch government have said that there is a need for uh, cultural change uh, within Abellio. Um, the minister will also be aware of comments from the trade union RMT. Can he indicate what discussions he has had uh, with staff unions or indeed with representatives of the travel and public uh, so that they can also be assured that the focus of ScotRail management is on an effective and improve, uh, uh, improving railway in Scotland? Uh, you know, I appreciate the question and the opportunity to say that I am reassured that the efforts in Scotland are on uh, providing the uh, rail service that we would expect and that the franchise uh, agreements will be delivered. In terms of the uh, concerns that have emanated from the situation uh, in Holland, I immediately on hearing of them sought reassurances from Abellio uh, and NS and had discussions at the highest uh, level. And I do believe because of the reassurance that have been given, because of the procurement process, the work of Audit Scotland and others, that these issues do not affect Scotland. But of course I will look very closely at the internal investigations uh, in Holland, which will include looking at all their franchise uh, bids uh, uh, over the last five years in about a month's time uh, to see if there is any uh, other issues I should be concerned about or aware of. Uh, but I am satisfied with what I have had so far. I had a meeting with STUC uh, and RMT as it happens today, and I have given them that assurance that I will continue to explore uh, the issue. And if we need to revisit, we will. Uh, but at, uh, uh, all evidence I have so far is that there is no impact on ScotRail or the procurement exercise that was undertaken in Scotland. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I wonder if the Minister can give us an update on how ScotRail are coping with the closure of the Winchborough Tunnel and alternative arrangements which, from my perspective, appear to be going quite well. Minister. I am delighted for Mr Mason that his experience is that it is going quite well. I know a number of other members are regular users of the uh, train service. I can report that the electrification work of the Winchborough Tunnel is progressing well and remains on schedule. These are early days, but going well. ScotRail has reported that their disruption management plan is working effectively and that services are being maintained as anticipated. And Transport Scotland has launched a new dedicated website at www.keepscotlandmoving.com.
Thanks, and I'll, I'll now just change seats with my colleague.